Wendy Wyman. I'm the Director of Programming at Photographiska New York. Photographiska is the internationally renowned destination for photography founded in Stockholm in 2010. With locations in Tallinn, Estonia and New York City and opening in Berlin in 2022. Guided by the principle of inspiring a more conscious world through the power of photography, Photographiska has built a safe haven of innovation, inclusivity, and self-expression. I want to thank you for joining us tonight and welcome you to the Fight for Freedom, a live conversation with photographer Martin Schuller and death row exonerees Kirk Bloodsworth and Sabrina Butler-Smith. Tonight's discussion will focus on the exhibition Death Row Exonerees, currently in the museum in New York. We will learn about how this project came to be and what you can do to support death row exonerees as leaders in the movement to abolish the death penalty. A little bit about the guest tonight. Photographer Martin Schuller is joining us live from New York City. Martin is known for his close-up portrait style photography and photographs of celebrities and public figures, including Barack Obama, Angelina Jolie, Rihanna, Oprah and Jay-Z, and Willie Nelson. He is also known for his work in commercial photography, including the iconic portrait of Colin Kaepernick for Nike's campaign commemorating the 30th anniversary of Just Do It. Born in Germany and based in New York, Schuller began his career as an assistant to the legendary Annie Leibovitz. Kirk Bloodsworth is joining us from Pennsylvania. He is the first person in the United States to be exonerated from death row based on DNA testing from a capital conviction. He was wrongfully convicted and sentenced to death in the state of Maryland. Kirk is the executive director of Witness to Innocence. Sabrina Butler-Smith is joining us from Tennessee. She was wrongfully convicted and sentenced to death in Mississippi as a teenager. She is the first woman in the United States exonerated from death row. Kirk and Sabrina will share their stories of how they were convicted and sentenced to death row for crimes they did not commit. First, we will look at two of the digital portraits that are currently part of the exhibition in the museum in New York. I remember people in the courtroom calling me a child killer. I hurt the most, you know, I'd never hurt a child. But they branded me this, and it stuck too for a long, long time. Even 10 years after I got out, people were still calling me a child killer. There's air vents in the prison, and I could hear the cat calls coming from the air vents. Kirk, Kirk, we're gonna get you, Kirk. We're gonna do to you what you did to that little girl. Every day, every day, for the longest kind of time. And that was my life, all the time. And it continued, even in the courtroom, you know? So when the gavel came down on my life after a two week trial, the courtroom erupted in applause, give him the gas and kill his ass, they said. Both trials, same thing. A part until four o'clock in the morning to my execution. Kid, I was scared to death. I'm not gonna lie to you, you know. Thank God for DNA though. Yeah. DNA, man. Saved my life. I was 19 years old when I made it to death row. I had never been uh, incarcerated before, so I didn't know what to expect. When they take you in, they have you, strip you of everything that you thought was yours. It, it's not yours anymore. They put bug spray in my hair. They put you in these tanks like your animals. They gave me a number, <laughs> took pictures. On my name tag, it had uh, capital murder. That was humiliating. 
but the walk to max security was you know hard for me because the officer that walked beside me told me that um he said you see those inmates out there in the field he said we tell them when to go to sleep when to get up what to eat you will die here and, and when he said that to me i didn't know what to do all i could do was cry because you know here's somebody telling you that you're gonna die what would you do if someone say that to you you know your life is not your own anymore you're a ward of the state and whatever they say that's that's what goes Wow, really powerful. Let's begin this conversation first by hearing from you, Martin. Welcome, all three of you. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Um, it's a real honor. Um, Martin, can you, can you tell us about this project in your own words, um, sort of what was the impetus for it, and maybe talk a little bit about your meeting with Kirk Fax in the fall of 2018 at 30th Street Station in Philadelphia. Well, yeah, hi, thank you. Uh, thank you for having us. Thank you for showing this work at the museum. I really, uh, very grateful for it and uh, trying to help the cause to abolish the death penalty. Um, I think for a museum is really courageous uh, act to do. So um, first of all, a big thank you to Kolga Fiska and, and everybody who works there. Um, I'm born in Germany and for me, you know, I've been living here now for 25 years in the United States. And for me, the idea that the death penalty still exists uh, has been bothering me. It's uh, hard to understand, especially for Europeans that went through the Second World War. And, that uh, a government kills people uh, in the name of the people. Um, it's, uh, it has, uh, I always felt like I have to do something about that subject matter. I have to help uh, try to abolish the death penalty. The death penalty doesn't make sense for, for a long list of reasons. And um, there has been, you know, work in that realm before. So I was trying to find a way to to to, to find a way to kind of do something different than uh, all the other work that has been done in that area. And I stumbled across this organization, Witness to Innocence, online, and um, I was immediately interested in their work because it's run by an exoneree, Kirk, who's here with us tonight, who who is director of the organization. And then all the other members are exonerees. So I was like, couldn't be any more perfect an organization that actually is uh, the people that are doing the work are actually the ones that experienced uh, these, uh, this torture. Um, so I started writing them emails, didn't hear back from them, <laughs> introducing myself, offering my service to help uh, you know, take pictures or uh, in any which way I can. And um, then I realized, you know, maybe the emails don't work. Maybe I should just go to an event. So I went to an event and met uh, Jenny, who works there, uh, who was very nice. And um, then again, I didn't hear anything for a while. So finally, Kirk is willing to meet with me in person at the train station in uh, Philadelphia. And he's like, you know what? Let me be honest. I've been photographed before, you know, for a magazine story, and I looked horrible. And I felt like I was treated like an object. I had to go to the scene of the crime that I've never been to. And, uh, you know, I just gotten out of prison. I was kind of disheveled, and the photographer liked that I looked so beaten up, and I was missing teeth. You know, they don't have dentists in prison. And now you come along and you want to do these mug shots of us. Everybody looks terrible in, the, in your pictures. So I was like a little bit devastated at that moment thinking, oh my God, I thought we were going to meet to talk about how we can work together. And he, and he just met with me to tell me he is not a big fan of my work, which, you know, it's, it's fair. So I showed him my book and then he started looking through my uh, clothes book and um, Half, half, halfway through the book, he's like, actually people, they just look the way they look, right? They don't look really that bad. It's just honest kind of pictures. And, and then he said, oh, actually they have a lot of soul. Um, there's a lot of humanity in your pictures, huh? 
and then he started changing his mind. And then in the end of the book, he says, you know what? I'm going to be the first one. I'm going to give this a try. So that was, um, that was uh, the beginning of our friendship right there. Kirk, or what do you think? Yeah. Did, I, did I give a fair account of what happened? <laughs> or do you, do you remember it differently? Well, you know, uh, uh, Martin uh, is just uh, an ace. Um, I, I honestly was worried about people like Sabrina and, and our other members. I was worried about how they were going to be portrayed. And he was right. Uh, although I never went to the crime scene with that other photographer because I thought it was bullshit. And uh, I, I just said, you know, this is something... That, these people didn't go there. I don't need, you know, I couldn't understand the artistic design. And I saw some of his other work in black and white and I thought, oh man, is this more of it? And then after talking with Martin over a period of time, I found that him to be straight with all of us and that he wasn't, he was trying to do something for witness to innocence. And after that, we became fast friends uh it, it, you know might have might have had more than one margarita but we had the best time and he is a remarkable human being and his talent as a photographer is exceptional and uh, i say that because i'm a visual person i've seen photographs and i know what things look like and i, I just was you know stunned by this thing and you know and the other fact is if Taylor Swift was on the co uh, cover of his other book. <laughs> I felt like, shoot, she wants to do it. Go ahead. And uh, and it was easy from there on. Um, I I just really, everybody at Witness Tennis Assistant Star, as I am concerned, just love Martin and his work. It is um, top shelf. Great. I have a question for you, Martin. I heard that all of the close-up video portraits were done in a studio in Puerto Rico and that you really wanted to have Sabrina participate. Um, and she was, and she'll talk about it now, but she was not so sure either. Um, why was that so important to you? And then we'll hear from Sabrina on her decision. Well, you know, after after meeting with Kirk, he said, you know, uh, you can come to our annual gathering every year. Witness to Innocence meets in a state where uh, an exoneree is from. Uh, last year, it was uh, taking place in Puerto Rico because Juan Melendez is originally from uh, Puerto Rico. But, you know, uh, Kirk told me, I can only tell people, you know, I recommend you be interviewed by Mark and you have your picture taken, but I can't guarantee it. You know, you have to talk to the uh, all the attendees yourself. And obviously, Sabrina being the uh, one of two women uh, members at Witness to Innocence, you know, I was cr hope the only one who was at the gathering. You know, I was hoping to, to that she would be willing to to partake. And um, yeah, I was just hanging out outside, drinking and smoking cigarettes. <laughs> and talking to people, explaining them what I was doing. And then I think in the end, everybody except for one or two people uh, was willing to, to work with me. So Sabrina, um, back in Puerto Rico, do you remember what it was like to sit for Martin and work with his team? Um, there's a very big difference between sitting for a still portrait and smiling than sitting for a video portrait. And Martin will talk about that later, but can you talk about how you felt? Well, the, how I felt at first, the reason why I was kind of skeptical about doing it at first, because we, as exonerees, to me, when you meet people, it's like you have to prove your self-worth. And we have been uh, raked over the coals so much. So the trusting part is a very hard issue. Um, and that was one of my reasons for being kind of apprehensive at first. But when I met Martin and started to talk to him and meet, you know, his crew and everything, I kind of relaxed a little bit and I felt a connection because I saw something in him that I had never seen in anyone else. So that's why I was more so willing to talk to him because, you know, I just felt like, May, hey, maybe this is something, you know. And so that's why I took the, you know, took the chance. 
And look where we are. Look where we are. It's, he does. He does beautiful work. Um, I like the way it turned out, and you know, I would recommend him to anyone. <laughs> That's great, um, Martin. Can you talk a little bit about the process and and how your projects evolve and and this yeah. new? Well, is it a new format? Was it a new format for you? It it was a new format, and then uh, you know, having uh, spent some time with Kirk, I learned and Jenny and Cara at the organization, you know, that um, a lot of their members are, are still have a really hard time talking about what happened to them. Um, you know, uh, some suffer from PTSD um, and it is, uh, you know, I realized that doing regular interviews, just filming these exonerees in front of a running camera might work for some, but I, I, I thought to myself, it probably is better if I just meet them one on one <clears throat> without a camera and just have a conversation. You know, I felt like maybe people will open up more and tell me more intimate stories that will get a little bit more personal. So I decided to do, the, you know, to have the the voice and the and the images kind of separated from each other. And and I did some experiments in my studio first. And I I like that when you go through the installation now. It's almost two stories, you know, you have the face and the visual that is one story and what you hear is another story and they don't necessarily go together. It's not that the faces replicate what you hear, but this discrepancy makes, hopefully creates like an uncomfortable uh, feeling. I kept the whole show really dark to, to uh, emphasize, you know, I wanted to make it uncomfortable, emotional and uncomfortable to, to kind of uh, give a sense of you can never replicate what it's like to be on death row for a crime you didn't commit, obviously, but to to, to raise a little more empathy for these people that have endured those uh, those horrors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it, it is a very different experience seeing it in person in the in the museum than seeing it here on the screen. So anyone who's listening. Please go check out the show. It's very, it's a very uh, different experience because the projections are huge. So every minute movement is a lot more dramatic than on a screen where you know it looks like they almost don't move at all. You know, so definitely the lips, the eyes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Kirk, I heard that the, what Martin just explained that that change happened actually after you had sat for him. Um, and you were trying to tell the story while he was photographing you. Jenny had explained to me, um, what, did that take a certain amount of courage to, to suggest doing it differently to Martin Schuller? You know, like, is there, uh, or were, were you totally comfortable saying, you know what, this isn't working for me and I want to consider doing this a little bit differently. Can we talk about it? Or did it not happen like that? Well, certainly, um, uh, I tell you the truth, I think I felt bad for Martin because uh, yeah. he had to sit through that in this, you know, the lens he had with me not moving. Um, and, you know, I can sit still pretty good. And, uh, and it was messing with my head, listening to myself drone about a story that I've talked about now for over 28 years and have endured uh, every day of my life. It's not a day goes by that I don't think of that situation. And, uh, and, and as Sabrina talked about it, that tank, you know, a tank that we could touch either wall by just going like that and being, uh, you know, uh, condemned to die. And we all know we're not supposed to be here. You scream and scream and scream and nobody hears you. It's like you're silent drowning on the ground. You know, it's like you're dry land drowning and you can't get anybody to hear you or you're being attacked by something that you can't see. And it was so many different takes on it. Uh, I had no idea that Martin was gonna uh, do it like that. Um, and, you know, cause He's looking at me through this lens like it's really a small place. And I'm looking at him and, you know, I, I'm bearing down. The more we get into it, the 
the harder I'm getting because I'm just focused on that moment. And he captured that as because honestly, that's the first time I've seen it. Um, it was just, I've seen the little takes and stuff, but I've never ever seen a finished project. And you know, um, it's scary to hear myself intone that fear to myself. You know, it's like uh, you're you're telling yourself the truth for once in your life, and how that engraves. And I'm not that kind of guy. You know, it's a uh, but this stuff makes you, uh, it's, it's really hard. I'm getting misty now thinking about it, you know, the, 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 and he brought that out. That's not easy to do for us, uh, I have to say, because, you know, it would have been a point and I'd have shut him off and then that would have been that because I don't want to endure it. But the more I did, the better I thought I felt and by the time I uh, got done. I remember I was like, it seemed like it took forever. I, w I was like, oh man, come on. It, you know, and he was just, you could see the strain of on the realization on his face and the uh, other fella in the room and, and how hard it was on them to just kind of live through that thing and his, the place he put us. And uh, it's remarkable what he's done with it. And, uh, I, I want people, if, if you want to know what it's like, listen to these uh, stories and you'll know, you know, Witness Dennis is full of, and uh, it, we're not unique. There's 172 of us on the planet that have been sentenced to death and almost died for something we had nothing to do with. And, uh, you know, I'm just glad to be here and be a part of this. Even though he, he took me kicking and screaming, uh, but I went and uh, and and to just back that up a second, I did it myself first because I wanted everybody, I wanted Sabrina and everybody to see what I had done, and uh, the finished product was amazing, and uh, I just I I trusted him from then on. I didn't have to think about it anymore. Yeah, why don't we actually talk about that you're currently the executive director of Witness to Innocence and an exoneree. Yeah. Can you tell us about what the organization does? I also want to just mention, I know it's in, in the chat section of this video. Um, this is, uh, this, this is a, um, fun, a fundraising moment. Um, so I want to just mention witnesstoinnocence.org backslash donate. Uh, this is a 501c3 organization. Uh, the funds from this chat will go to Witness to Innocence. So I just want to mention that. It'll also be part of the evening. Um, but talk about your role, uh, Kirk, and, and talk about how that organization began a little bit. Well, I've been the executive director actually two weeks, I mean, two years uh, this week, I think it, it was. I can't remember if it was October eight or not but it was right around that time i had just been hired to be the deputy director and you know just like martin i had to you know, prove myself to a certain extent and i i love the exonerees i love they're my brothers and sisters so sabrina is a sister is as much as my own sister back home uh, and we our mission statement basically is you know, Witness to Innocence is the only national organization in the United States comprised of and led by exonerated death row survivors and their family members. Uh, we are to abolish the death penalty by empowering exonerated death row survivors and their loved ones to become effective leaders in the abolition movement. And certainly Sabrina and everybody else uh, not just in this, Kwame Ajamu and all the others, uh, Ray Crone, who founded, co-founded the organization. Um, uh, our executive director, when I got on board, uh, left. And I, I, I didn't know what to do. I had only been a deputy for two weeks. And I just, as a Marine, you're never supposed to volunteer for anything. 
And that's the first damn thing we do is just, uh, okay, I'll do it. And, uh, and that's, I've been here two years now. And they seem to like me unless they're telling me a fib, but. We love you. We love you. I love you too, honey. And it's, uh, it's the best group of people you could possibly have that have come from all different walks of life. And I, I, I want to add to your ad because I texted uh, Jenny while we were sitting here. So um, uh, it's uh, text innocent to 855-905-4984. That's innocent, I-N-N-O-C-E-N-T to 855-905-4984 or to, you know, witnessinnocence.org slash donate. Um, you can do either one. And it's a, like you were saying, it's a, uh, um, a, five, uh, uh, a 501c3 and it's tax deductible. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of programs. I was working on with one today, uh, act, uh, Accuracy and Justice, um, with the number two uh, female exoneree, uh, Deborah Milky, who, you know, uh, is an, another story. I mean, these guys, I, you know, I send them out and they make my job that much better because uh, their stories are so compelling. But um, we also have an emergency fund that is for the exonerees themselves. You imagine in this midst of COVID and everything that's going on, people have lost their jobs. I mean, we're, uh, we're just, we're holding on and it's a day by day thing. So you, we are about <clears throat> abolishing the death penalty, but we're also about empowering exonerees. Sometimes exonerees need help just like everybody else, and they need it more so. And uh, that's what I'm all about as the executive director. Great. Thank you so much. Um, this conversation is actually, we scheduled this for this evening just ahead of this weekend, World Day Against the Death Penalty and Witness to Innocence working to abolish the death penalty. I want to ask you and Sabrina and Martin, um, how do you think this exhibition of Martin's work will impact people's views on the death penalty? Sabrina? It's a big... You want me to talk? You want me to say something? Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm out of I, breath. I kinda, you know, okay. Well, I think his exhibition will shed more light on the impact of wrongful incarceration and the death penalty as a whole in this country. He shows the ugly truth of how something is so wrong with this picture and we need to fix it now instead of later. That's what I feel like. I wrote that um, today when that question was asked and I feel like his exhibition really shows what it does to people and the impact of how innocent people in this country are being treated. And I think that um, with this uh a lot of people should go to the exhibition to get the experience. Guys, do you want to talk a little bit about your cases? I think maybe some people are curious to hear about what happened to you. You know, um, you want to maybe give a quick synopsis of your, your cases, how you ended up on death row? Sabrina, you want to go first? Yeah. Um, well, I, my case happened when I was only 17. Um, in a little town called Columbus, Mississippi. And at the time, you know, I was trying to uh, be an adult with two children, but I was a kid myself. So basically they took me through um, uh, being found guilty for something that I didn't do. I ended up um, being put on death row. Um, I also ended up, uh, after that happened to me, I ended up finding, um, two other attorneys who came into my case and found out that my son had heart problems, kidney problems, and chronic bowel syndrome. It was nothing that I had done to cause his death. Um, and uh, I have this a child today that has the same disease. So it basically was a nightmare. You know, I ended up spending six and a half years, two years, nine months on death row. Um, and 
once you're afraid, you know, being exonerated, it's not over. You know, you have to go through your life trying to see where you fit in into this, you know, in this community, into, into society as a whole. And it was very difficult. Um, so, you know, these types of programs and exhibitions and things that are being done today are uh, eye opener and it's, it's much needed, you know, and I think that the more we do this, the more we can educate the public as to, you know, uh, what really happens behind the scenes. And um, I just think that, you know, I'm grateful to be here, basically. And yeah, from, from what I learned is like, once you get out of prison, you know, you don't get any help. If you actually do commit a crime and you get let out on parole, you have a parole officer trying to help you find jobs, trying to find education, trying to help you with housing. Absolutely. And you're exonerated, you found innocent. You, you, they just said, oh, our bad, like yeah. you said. That's our, right, our bad, they just let you go. I mean, there's nothing, there's no help. No help. And you apply for a job and they do a background check and they see a murder charge and you can explain to them, I've been exonerated, I'm innocent, I didn't do it. It doesn't matter because you can't look beyond it, right? Right, and that's not fair. You know, I really don't feel like that's fair because you, the system, made this horrible mistake. And I think that they should be held accountable to fix what they do to innocent people. I just do. I would agree. Uh, it's, you know, there's no recourse for an exonerated person. Yeah. As a matter of fact, there's nothing in the Constitution that, you know, other than saying, you know, a person is innocent until uh, proven guilty. And, you know, we have a right to uh, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. But you damn sure can't pursue it if you have been uh, put on death row for something you didn't do. Right. Uh, in my case, is that all right? Do you want me to go into my case? Yeah, yeah. And so in my case, it was 1984. I just got out of the Marine Corps. And, um, you know, I was on a discharge, had, you know, I, but I was going fishing. My father was a fisherman, his father, his father. I, I mean, I've been working, uh, been on the water. This is the longest time I've ever been in dry land. And, um, I had got, just got married and, and wound up in Baltimore County, Maryland. Um, it's a, a county about 100 miles away from where I'm from. Uh, a little girl by the name of Dawn Hamilton uh, was found brutally murdered in a wooded area near her home. A search ensued for the killer who was described by five eyewitnesses. Um, two of which, and, and, and more said he was six foot tall and taller. And uh, the main witness said he was six foot five, curly blonde hair, bushy mustache, tan skin, and skinny. Now, that ain't me, no matter what you say. I'm about six foot tall. I was a big guy. You know, I'm not a little fella. And uh, I don't tan because my hair was as red as a fire, fire blow back in those days. They didn't care about anything I said, whether I was innocent or not. They didn't care, I kept telling them. And you know, a police report came in eight days before I was arrested. And um, they never went back to check and that would damn everybody in the end and prove my innocence uh, as well. But 19 years later, yeah, uh, I spent eight years, 10 months and 19 days in prison two years on death row, slept right underneath the gas chamber. And these people didn't give a hoot in hell about who I was or why I was there. They were blinded by what I was accused of, just like Sabrina. Yeah. You know, and you get in this, this mode and you keep trying to talk to these people. And um, I, can I tell an anecdotal story about my lawyer? So yeah, I, I, somebody, I got to laugh because a lot of this stuff is serious, but my lawyer came in in the uh, county jail where I was uh, being waiting for to go to trial. And he was a public defender and he uh, was a prosecutor at one time. Um, and everybody said how good he was. So he comes in. Now I want you guys, it's in the audience, to picture 
this uh, uh, prison visiting room with a glass partition in front of you, okay? Lawyer comes in off the street through an archway. It's eight foot high and 10 foot wide. And he sits right in front of that glass. There's an archway on either side of this brick wall, right? He sits with his back to the brick wall and the first thing out of his mouth, he says, Kirk, you're in a lot of trouble. I thought he had to go to college for that, man. I'm in, I'm in deep stuff. <laughs> and uh, so he, he says, but don't worry. I know my way around the courtroom. I know my way around the criminal justice system. We're going to find our way out of here together. We talked about the case for about 20 minutes, one of only three visits. He ever come to see me in for like 10, 15 minutes at a clip, usually on a Friday when he had to get home, you know. And uh, so we talked about the case for about 20 minutes and he gets ready to leave and he, he tells me the same thing. He says, Kirk, I know my way around the courtroom. We're going to find our way out of here together. Put his hand on the glass like that and uh, said goodbye picked up his briefcase, turned around, and ran right in the wall. <laughs> That's funny. Uh. What in the hell is I've gotten into? This. He not he dropped he ran in the wall, knocked his glasses off, <laughs> dropped his briefcase on the floor. I called my father up. I said, this son of a bitch can't find his way out of the court, uh, out of the jail. I'm in trouble. He was right. I was in a lot of trouble. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that was the only, you know, years later when we wrote the book, I, he tried to call, he called me on the phone and said, it didn't happen that way. I said, you're a damn lie. You still here today. You would uh, climb a tree and tell a lie and won't stand on the ground to tell the truth. It's true. You're right. And so, uh, you know, from then on, I, I knew that, and then I started seeing other people, Freddie Pitts, who just passed away, God bless his soul, and uh, and different ones, Ron Connie, Ray Crone, all these different cats, man, and uh, uh, Kwame Ajamu, who's in this uh, situation with us, and, and Ray Crone, just hundreds of people. And uh, it, I, I, I had to, we, we had to do something about it. And uh, I, I don't tend to stop. And I've got a bunch of brothers and sisters behind me. That's We're going to make some sand on this thing. And I think Martin's pro, uh, uh, show here is going to do it. Um, it's it's going to put a spotlight on us. And I just uh, hope and pray that, um, you know, people pay attention. Uh, and, you know, but, 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 day, I just want to say this real quick. Um, somebody. And I'm not going to mention who called somebody a monster today over something that happened the other night. I ain't going to mention no names, but that's what a prosecutor called me, yeah. a monster. And it wasn't true then, and it ain't true today. But Kirk, in, in your story, what is so mind-boggling is that you were set free based on DNA testing. They found, then you, you for 10 years, you tried to con, uh, convince a DA to actually use a DNA that was found on the murder victim to compare it with the national database of sexual offenders. They didn't do it until when? Until like 2002 or something? It was um, 2003. 2003. It took them 10 years to follow your advice, and when they finally did it, it turns out that the real killer was actually in prison with you. Yes, yeah, sleeping in a, a tear below me, um, and never said a word. There was a police report that came out eight days before I, um, I was arrested about that guy, and they never went back to check. And uh, the truth is, um, they had told me that DNA was inadvertently destroyed. Well, turns out that it wasn't inadvertently destroyed. It was in the closet of the last judge I had in a paper bag in a cardboard box sitting in the floor. Crazy. I'm telling you now, we, uh, and I am not unique as, 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 uh, you know, uh, Sabrina sits right here with me. It is, uh, 
it's just one case after another, one case after another. They believe it's over 5% people on death row today are innocent. That's thousands of people. You know, I mean, that's that's a lot of people. Yes. We can't have this thing. And I tell you the truth, I think that the estimate is lower. Uh, you know, I mean, higher than that. Yeah. But, you know, I had to fight tooth and nail to get out. And uh, one of the hardest things for me was when my mother passed away. Five months before I got out of prison. I never get that back. I won't get those nine years with her back or that last five months of her life. I got told by a priest in a jail cell that my mother had just passed away. They let me go see her body for five minutes in handcuffs and shackles. I kissed her goodbye. Yeah. Yeah. It's bad. <laughs> I have a question um, from from people that are watching. I do. I'm taking a question from Facebook. There are a lot of people watching right now. Uh, my colleague shared this with me. This is a question, Martin, for you. Um, there's really no easy transition, Kirk, from that into this. But thank you so much for being so generous and sharing your story, which I know we didn't plan for. So I, I do think that people should come to Photographiska in New York and come experience the full exhi exhibit because you, you're you in a very dark room with the image in front of you. And um, it's a very different experience than being together now and watching it on the computer or in your home. Uh, so I encourage everybody to, to come and see it. We are open. Um, the question is something that uh, Kirk mentioned before about Martin, what was your, how did you resist the de decision to put the exonerees in maybe what they would have been wearing in, in prison? I think we kind of know the answer, but uh, Kirk said previous photographers had approached and, and done work uh, with, with prisoners in, in, in their uh, prison uniform. Was it a planned style or did it evolve after meeting the exonerees? Was there did you have any idea about what you were going to do? That's from Chris Mullen on Facebook. No, uh, everybody's just wearing whatever they were wearing that day. You know, um, I had a lot of exonerees wearing the blue T-shirts, uh, the Witness to Innocence T-shirts. So after a while, I started to discourage them from wearing all the same T-shirts. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, they shouldn't have been in prison in the first place. So I never felt I should put them in a prison uniform, um, you know, but, you know, obviously prison uniforms photograph great, you know, because everybody knows immediately what the story is about. But since uh, I was always planning to do a video installation, I don't didn't, never felt like I needed a visual clue to to explain what the story is about, you know. Uh, so I never considered prison uniforms. Yeah, I wouldn't have considered it either. Huh? I wouldn't have considered that either. You, yeah. I, after I met Kirk, I was like, you know what? Hmm. You know, you have all different ideas as a photographer, but I quickly came to realize that would not fly anyways. You know, even if I did ever want to yeah. do it. Yeah. yeah. Sabrina, did you have anything you wanted to add, um, you know, as far Just, as, yeah. I agree with them. I agree with them. I would not have wore it, you know. Uh, that would really, you know, because to tell your stories is enough. You know, it's like, like Kirk said earlier, you know, it's like you're in a box, really, and you're going over this. And to just constantly go through that is already hard enough. And to be, you know, to put on a prison uniform, no, that, that was a horrible idea. Horrible. Yeah. He never asked that, though. Mine never asked that. He was really kind. He never asked that. He yeah. always was concerned about yeah. our comfort. That's right. How we uh, felt. And it was always willing to stop and have a chat. He was never, like, indisposed. Uh, yeah. And when, when, he, when he was working, and even then, he had time for each yeah. and every one of us. I have nothing 
but really awesome things to say about Martin Short. And I know he don't like that stuff. But I uh, I make certainly make blush. You make blush. I'll, I'll get him. I'll get him. He's a uh, he's a good man. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, shall we uh, shall we talk about why the death? Because I think a lot of people, and you know, even sometimes I talk to friends, and they're kind of on the fence about the death penalty. I'm oftentimes surprised when I when I talk about my work with you guys that. You know, I'm always assuming all my friends are 100% against the death penalty. And then sometimes they're like, well, but if somebody killed children, if somebody did something really horrific, you know, I think they don't deserve to be on this earth. You know, people talk like that. So can you guys explain to everybody why, I know the answers, but I want to hear it from you, why, you, why you're so strongly opposed against the death penalty? Sabrina? Well, my thought is this. All right. You say that a lot of people say that, well, you know, the worst of the worst, you know, they, they need to go to prison or whatever the case may be or go to death row. How can you say that when we have pe cases out here right now that are horrible cases? Charles Manson case is one of them. I mean, he, he was responsible for nine people. I mean, this was a horrible, brutal case. But yet and still, he didn't get the death penalty. So how can you decide or say which case should get it in which case should. So I feel like the death penalty is not portrayed the way they, they set it out to be. Some get it and some don't. So I feel like if a person is innocent and you give them the death penalty and you kill that person, you can't go back and say, oh, my bad. Hey, uh, I, I'm sorry. You know, you can't pull nobody from the grave like, like Freddie said. So why not take the money that is used for the death penalty, put it where it should be, in school, schools, roads, education purposes, things like that. And you know what I'm saying? I think that's that's what it should be used for. If you commit a crime, yes, serve your time. But if you get it wrong, you can go back and you can fix that as opposed to the death penalty. You can't fix the death penalty. So why not, you know, give that person time or whatever the case may be. And if they're, you know, if you can go back and fix it, then fix that. That's why I'm opposed to the death penalty. I don't think it's right. I just don't. Yeah, I, I would agree with Sabrina 100%. I mean, you know, Freddie Pitts, uh, it's on the back of our shirts. And I swear, my shirt is dirty. I would show it to you. But it's, um, he would say, um, you can free a man from prison. Yeah. But you can't free him from the grave. That's right. And we, you know, we, we talk about this stuff and who gets death and who doesn't, who, you know, gets what, when, and it's not up to anybody to kill another person if our society says it's wrong. Yep. That don't make sense. That's an ox riding a moron. That's right. An oxymoron. And so we can't uh, have this kind of thing. We have proved so many issues that the death penalty is fraught with error. Yeah. Fraught with error. You can stop right there because we're sentencing people who are innocent to death. And they said, what about DNA? What about it? It's only as good as the people using it. We found this woman up in Massachusetts purposely, I mean purposely, uh, just took DNA tests and said they matched what the cops said to them. You know, it was over 20,000 cases. Houston, Texas. I mean, I could go on and on and on and on and on. It's just not right. And one you thing, to too, Kurt, one thing too, too, Kurt, you can't, you either going to be pro-life or pro-death. One or two. You can't be both. There's no way. That doesn't make sense. You can't be both. That's if right. somebody's pregnant and you want them to have a baby, okay, we'll have the baby, but then you believe in the death penalty. That doesn't make sense. I mean, you, which one is it? it? I think, you know, I, I agree 100%. This is not some cafeteria yeah. in life where you get to pick and choose who dies and who lives. Normally, it's a poor person, yeah. a person of color, yeah. and, you know, somebody that might not have any mental capacity. It's, it's a bunch of things, what they call disposable people. Yeah. And they kill a person here and there and say they, uh, you know, make a society. 
The death penalty has been in uh, action for 500 years since since St. Thomas Aquinas back in the Middle Ages. It has been tested and tried and failed yeah. in many, many ways. And they can shore it up all they want and they can put white gloves on and say that it's uh, uh, this is the best way to do it. But they're botching executions in Oklahoma and Texas and everywhere else. Yeah. They pick one person to, to kill because, you know, we would have been far better off, I think, it's far better off to let the person responsible for killing Dawn stay alive because they have to be accountable for what they've done, just right. like sure. all of us. We have yes, to man. live with what they've done. They have to be accountable by living too. That's my thing. That's all about. That's right. Death penalty's got to go. Yeah. And then they got to wash their backs because you're not safe in prison. And no. sleep with one eye open. So... And, you know, and from what I learned from talking to you all, it doesn't make any sense on many other levels. It's not a deterrent, you know, nope. they have the death penalty in most states in the South, they don't have it in the North. The murder rate in the South is higher. So if the yeah, death penalty is. was keeping away from people killing each other, there would be a lower murder rate in states that have the death penalty, but quite the opposite is true. Most right. of the states that have the death penalty have a higher murder rate than states that don't have the death penalty. Absolutely. Another, another uh, reason to be against the death penalty is uh, financial. You know, yeah. a death penalty case costs three times as much as a life in prison without parole case. Yeah. Uh, the the um, Kirk, you, you know more about that probably, but the the jury has has to be yeah. certified. There's yeah. more rounds of appeals. It is a, a much more involved case. So some counties, even in states like Ohio, some counties don't ever sentence anyone to die because they can't afford it, you know? Yeah. So you can be in one county in Ohio, kill somebody, and they try uh, to, to put you to, to death, and you're like five miles down the road, and they will not try you for the death penalty. So it just, it, it's it makes sense. Yeah, the, the disparities that are involved in the death penalty are so great that, you know, we've had so many different committees and, uh, you know, all these different uh, uh, study commissions and different things about how the death penalty is fraught with error. That's just a few of the things. There was the one that I did in, uh, in Maryland at the time. By the way, we don't have the death penalty in Maryland anymore. That's right. And so, you know, we don't have the death penalty. And everywhere we have been and fought against the death penalty, witness innocence has been there. And so, you know, we, you know, we're working on on some of these southern places, but everybody's just got to stop. This is legal lynching, and uh, right. they need to quit. And uh, right. for you know, we're going to kill more innocent people. And I know just as sore as I sit here that uh, we're doing it all the time and they got to stop saying uh, that, you know, it's it's for justice. It ain't for nothing. It's for vengeance. And uh, vengeance like is God, say the Lord. So right. they can forget that. Just like the Purvis, uh, Purvis case that's coming up December the 3rd. He's fighting for his life. He's only asking for test the DNA. If somebody feels like they're innocent, what is so hard with you testing the freaking DNA? That don't make sense. It doesn't it make sense. The truth. That's that's one reason. It, it shows that's the truth. Crazy. They just don't want to see. We had a Supreme Court justice one time, and yeah. Scalia said the death penalty is should be given if uh, improperly rendered sentence of death, even though the person's innocent. Now that wow. should scare every daggone body. On the planet, that should. Because they can do it, and they can, and they do it Get every day. That's right. But then they tell the guilty person that you shouldn't have done that crime. But yet, and still, they turn around and do what they're telling you not to do. That don't make sense. That don't make sense. And then some people uh, think being in prison is not so bad. You know, they feel like we need to kill the people because prison, they have TVs and they have a good old time. You know, you hear, hear these, coming from Germany, I'm always in shock by, by people 
you know, talking as if prisons in America, prisoners are having a good life, you know. You know, when you describe what, Sabrina, when you described to me what death row felt yep. like, you know, it's like dark clouds coming in, it's torture. You it is torture. If you call, if you call seeing a person get raped, if you call a person's insides falling out on the ground and they're picking her up on a mattress and carrying her out because they wouldn't give her proper medical treatment. If you call rats being in your cell, if you call uh, food, that God knows what it is. If you call uh, being cold when you're supposed to be warm, if you call being hot when you're supposed to be cool, if you call uh, sitting in a one man cell no bigger than your bathroom thinking of, about to go crazy, if you call that a good time, then I don't know what planet you're living on. Yeah. But it's not, it's certainly not America. They could have HBO and cable in that damn place, and it, it's still That's right. the evilest place on, on the planet for a person. That's right. Your subject, you know, I, I was treated so unfairly for so many yeah. years. And, and you know, you could see the mice, and, you know, I they had rats the size of cats. That's right. I'm not kidding. Right. It's, uh, you know, uh, I, you know, we have to, we cannot incarcerate our way out of this problem. We certainly can't execute our way out of this problem. We That's need right. to uh, 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 change what we're doing and uh, and start thinking of uh, a, you know a different way about it. And I know progressive is a bad word these days, but they can all go jump a lake because it's the way it's supposed to be. You can't treat people. When I was a Marine, they said you're only as good as your slowest, most man. Period. You can't go no better than the worst person in your society. We shouldn't be treating these people this way. And, uh, you know, there's not saying that people don't deserve to go to jail and, and get locked up for what they do. Some of these things are horrific. Anybody knows about it. Say. But we need to change the way we're dealing out this kind of punishment. And the death penalty has to go. Uh, I, you know, I, I think about it all the time. It's um, it needs to it needs to end. Yeah. Don't you think it's even worse being in prison all your life? If you have life without parole, it might be a worse sentence than uh, being you know being executed. Might just maybe a way out. Well, you know, people have a, a tendency to think that when you go to prison, you get all these perks. You go to college, you do all this stuff. That's a bunch of crap. Yes, it don't is. it don't work that way. You know, you have to survive. You're if somebody gives you 10 years, okay, to go to prison, you ain't supposed to go to prison and get more punishment. Mm -hmm. They're taking 10 years of your life. That is a big thing. They add all these draconian sentences across the country since the 1980s. It makes me so ill. You know, give a man a thousand years. You can't do 25 most of the time and 40. And some of these people, exonerated people, uh, 40, 40 some years, uh, you know, Kwame, 27 years. I mean, it's unbelievable. And uh, we need to change the way we think. I would far better have somebody that robbed me, right? Learn how to get a job and yep. educate them. <laughs> Educate. You know, give them a little piece of mine, help them out, get them up the road, and give them a helping hand, hand up, not a hell of a hand out. But it's different. You know, people think you can go to prison, they should punish the shit out of you even more. I don't see it. I, I think we need to, uh, uh, you know, try to find out how we can do this in a better way. And, and then we have a lot right? less people in prison. That's right. And then what if, that's right. What if you, the ones you do send to prison, and then you say to them, okay, you just serve your time, but you didn't rehabilitate them now. And then you throw them back out there on the street. What do you think you're doing? You're creating monsters in there. That's exactly what you're doing if you're not rehabilitating people that are going to prison. You just, you're not rehabilitating. And if you say you are, you're lying. Because like I said, what Kirk said, if they put water beds in there, I don't want to see it. I'm not going back in there. I don't care what they do. 
that that's a place that I just, it breaks you down mentally, physically, and emotionally. It just tears you apart. And for a person to have a life sentence, it is worse. To me, it's worse. Yeah, that's a, I mean, the, the, uh, we have to stop thinking uh, about that idea that there's more to punish you at. The whole yeah. idea behind incarceration is to take, give you 10 years to make yourself get back. Prison was never meant to be forever. No. And certainly killing people and just give them all this time didn't help. We got 2.3 million prisoners in the United States. That's crazy. That's like, that's like major cities. Hmm. And, you know, that happened after the, the draconian laws of the 80s that came along in the 90s yeah. with the different administrations that were trying to be tough on crimes and mm -hmm. predators and all that kind of mess. Yeah. And then you got too much. Just It's too much. And uh, there was only like 400,000 people in prison before that started. And now we got almost 3 million people. And that's crazy. Probably and you throwing prisons. the babies in there too. You throwing babies in there with with young, yeah. with older people. That's crazy. We need to change it. We do. I know <laughs> Sabrina and I are very excited. I know I, yeah. get, I get so worked up over this stuff. It's, I do. Uh, well, then the organization has the right executive director. So. I don't know. Yeah. Yes, they do. I, I think yes, so. I'm trying. I, 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 also, I do want to point out again for people who may have joined us later in the conversation that um, Witness to Innocence is the only national organization in the United States composed of and led by exonerated death row survivors and their family members. That's right. You can learn more about the organization by visiting the site at witnesstoinnocence.org. And you can donate at witness to innocence.org backslash donate. Uh, Martin, before we conclude this conversation, I know you've encouraged everybody that can uh, to visit Photographiska in New York City. We have been open. We are uh, adhering to all of the safety measures around the pandemic and, and COVID, uh, temperature checks and time ticket entrances throughout the day. Uh, we're at a 25% capacity. I'm actually in the museum right now. It's really lovely. Um, do you have ideas of after we present this exhibition, what's next for the project? Well, yeah, I, you know, normally I do a project and then I finish it and then I find another project. I like projects that are often, you know, that are really focused you know, um, I photographed homeless people on one street corner in Los Angeles. Uh, I photographed 75 Holocaust survivors. And what I like about this is that, you know, there's 172 uh, people that were exonerated that were sentenced to, to death at some point. And, um, but the problem with this project is that I like these guys so much that I feel like <laughs> uh, it, it makes it hard to move on. And, uh, you know, I met, uh, I uh, photographed and interviewed 16. So there's a lot more to go. So we'll see. Well, the ex exhibition is going to be in the museum till January 10th. I should call that out. So there is plenty of time. We might be in a different, hopefully we'll be in a different space and place. Uh, things will get good and, you know, we can open open more things up. Um, Sabrina, Kirk, Martin, I just, on behalf of the Museum Photographisco Worldwide, I just want to thank you. Uh, you didn't have to talk with us tonight. You didn't have to share your stories. Um, we're so grateful to have you, to know you, to call you our new friends. And we can't wait to meet you in New York. Um, um awesome. so thank you and i want to thank uh jenny and allison in the witness to innocence office who have been just really wonderful to work with in planning for this event uh and jan and martin's office who um, also has been just so helpful in the process of reopening the museum uh when we were closed and we knew that we wanted to pivot uh and show this very very important work which uh, feels, uh, you know, very in and of the moment right now and a really important uh, topic. So I think we'll conclude here. 
Um, I do hope the conversation continues, um, possibly online um, and elsewhere. And again, I just thank you so, so much. And I wish you all the best uh, thank you. in life and happiness. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, God bless you there, Mark. God bless you, God. All right. Bye. Peace.